listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting The Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. It is November 28th. Mm -hmm. It is the end of this season of Mental Health Monday. We're going to take a little recess for the month of December. And then we'll pick up again in January. That means we get to dig into emotions and the gospel. Deaconess Heidi Gaiman. Good morning, Heidi. Good morning. I'm a little sad because it's our last episode for this calendar year. Yeah. But it's I'm, good though. It'll allow us some time to process, right? Oh. <laughs> it does. That was good stuff. I know. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So last time we talked about one of the tools to have in our emotional processing toolbox. Let's revisit that again. Why is, mm. why is it helpful? Why should we have an emotional processing toolbox? Yeah, I would be curious, like what you guys remember from that even, you know, because I talk about it so much in my life that I think it just seems like common sense to me. <laughs> like You should process your emotions. It's a good idea. And so I'm always curious, you know, other people's relationship with that. From a spiritual as well as a mental health vantage point, our, we talked about last time and the time before that, that our, our bodies are made, our spirits are all of us, right? Our heart, soul, mind, and strength are made by God, knit together by him with processes. And they're going to happen whether we like them or not. And emotional processing is one of those processes. However, we also want a toolbox because we can be supportive of ourselves. We can bring those things before God. We can be in relationship with those parts of ourselves. And that will only help our spiritual, emotional, mental, relational health, all those areas of our lives when we are, you know, building that awareness, but also supporting ourselves. And tools, we talked about contemplation already is one that art of just giving it a second, right? That space in order to process the emotions that we just talked about, as well as the thinking, the giving some cognitive energy, if you will, to just considering our emotions a little bit more, considering our experiences or what's going on in our body a little bit more. That those are ways that we support ourselves and actually can can be our own tools for our mental, emotional spiritual and relational health. What did you guys, when we talked about that, like, what did you take away about the value of processing? I mean, I think it's hugely valuable. I'm, I'm one of those maybe odd people that really enjoys doing this kind of work. I like sitting in that space of working through emotions and I know a lot of people find it super uncomfortable. I think one thing I did realize as we talk through this though, is the intentionality that goes along with it because sometimes even if we feel or, or notice things that are happening, there is a, a certain intentionality that happens using these specific tools and being aware of the fact that you actually are processing your emotions and how, uh-huh. even if we think we know something, there's probably more we can learn about how our bodies work and, and all of these things as we kind of mature as yeah. in, in how God created us to function. Yeah, I think you can use what comes to mind as you say that, Sarah, and first of all, I'll compliment your ability to do depth work is what we call it, right? Like you like the deeper things of life. And I think that's a good point. Some people enjoy deep stuff a little bit better. The good news is emotional processing can be done in many different spaces, right? Like many different levels of depth. And so any work that you put toward this, the toolbox doesn't look the same. That's why it's a toolbox. There's not just one tool called depth. Instead, there's like lots of different spaces we can be in with that. But I think of a very Lutheran example of remembering our baptism, right? This is kind of a, it, you know, it's just a very useful metaphor for emotional processing, but also just a very direct way that we emotionally process. And so we we know that our baptism is there. It exists in a single moment, right? We are baptized into Christ's family and we are redeemed, set free, forgiven. All of that happens in that moment. Um, and and that's that, that work of God inside of us that just happens without our knowledge or work or anything we could do with it. But there is an intentionality to remembering our baptisms and integrating that identity into our daily life. And there's an intentionality to integrating the work that God is doing in us with the idea of emotions, the concept of emotions that he made up, as well as, you know, being with him in that and getting to know ourselves and him in. And so 
I think it's just a kind of a cool way to think about it. We are dualistic people by nature as Lutherans that we believe that, that God is going to do this with or without me. And also I can be a part of it. So our tool that we're looking at today is articulation. Before we talk about the how, what is what is articulation? <laughs> yes. So in the book, I talk especially in this section a lot about kids because they are they're like learning verbalization, right? But they are surprising. <laughs> like they're so surprisingly <laughs> articulate so often. I think this has to do with the fact that they don't have the same inhibition as adults. So they just let things pop out of their mouths, right? And so articulating is just that, like letting things come out of our mouth to create a verbal connection or metaphor to the emotional sensation or experience that we're having. Hmm. I... Oh, now I'm lost for words. <laughs> I was just thinking of an example of like how kids, yes, just like blurt out things. This isn't necessarily emotions, but just how sometimes kids surprise us with just how they have vocabulary that we don't realize they have. Mm-hmm. In the car the other day, I said something about hold on to your horses and my son blurts out idiom alert. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, I just want to like give him a high five. Like kiss that brain. <laughs> That's said- impressive. But he said it without missing a beat. Like, he's, like he's definitely your and child. I, like, I love it. Yep. yep. I was like, that was a pretty good one. I had to tell his teacher about that. Mm-hmm, she's mm-hmm. like, oh, that's, no, really, that's she like, was really yeah. that's like social media worthy where you're like, I'm so, you know, I love parenting in moments like this. Like, you're like, oh, that's like the really good stuff. I was pretty, yeah, I was pretty proud of that. Well, like, and that, part of it is like, because you're seeing a part of himself, right? You're like discovering yeah. him. That's, Andy, what happens to us when we let our emotions have that little bit of space. We discover something about ourselves that that is often surprising and surprisingly articulate. And so I think that's really cool. Kids, again, are just really more natural at this than we are as adults because we have so much shame built into us from our (laughs) our early years and our other experiences that we, I think, want to be a little detached in some ways, whereas kids, They're not necessarily afraid to jump in and experience the emotion. What we can do for them as adults, in particular, since we're on this topic, is to let them have a little bit of space to discover that, you know, to ask them, like, what do you feel in your body? And what name three emotions you had today? What did those look like to you? And how do you experience them? You know, that it sounds like really I mean, I can hear myself even as a as a mom being like, I'm not going to do that because that just takes so much time and energy and I'm just trying to get people's shoes on, you know. But I promise you it goes a really long way in all of our joint goal of trying to have, you know, regulation to some degree or freedom and restoration in our emotions without feeling like our emotions are taking over ourselves, our relationships or our homes. So I would point the listener to the end of this chapter, actually on page 92 in Emotions and the Gospel Created for Connection. There is the articulation 101 that has some ways to process that with yourself and other people. So you don't have to just remember what I said on KFUO. So since we're talking about kids and vocabulary, how does vocabulary serve us in articulation of emotions? Mm -hmm. Well, and that's why I brought up like the metaphor that is language. And so I should backtrack and also say that this can be nonverbal communication. So we can Mm -hmm. articulate simply to ourselves. Like there can be a language within us, right? Which is kind of back to that thought, but it's a little bit different. It's like us creating coherency, right? And some meaning and kind of collecting the thoughts to be something that serves us well. We also can articulate with gestures quite a bit. Like we are nonverbal communicators and there is language even in the expression of our eyes, right? We talked about that a little bit when we talked about facial response. So just know that for you who are not people who love to articulate, there is a lot of freedom in this. So that's good news. But language is, it's a metaphor. We are attaching letters and words to something in order for us to make sense of it. 
that is a, a good gift of God. You know, he is the word, which makes, I think, language even more special for us because it's so attached to who he is, too. And so when we articulate our emotions, not only are we connected to God as emotional beings with an emotional God, we are connected in articulating with a God of language, someone who does create the idea of having letters and and words to make meaning in our lives. And, and having, I guess, a, I don't know if larger or more robust, robust. <laughs> robust. Hey, I know that's you. the word you're looking for. Robust. I can tell robust. robust <laughs> Please use that with your child today. Robust. I, robust. I love that word. Vocabulary in order to articulate <laughs> our emotions, I think is, I mean, yeah, so we might only have like four or five words that we can use to describe mm-hmm. our emotions, but mm-hmm. when we can have a more robust vocabulary, we can express more. Well, exactly. And, you know, the research of Brene Brown, there's some of it in this book, in this section, because she found that in doing interview with thousands of people from many different, you know, collected experiences, most humans have, I'm not going to get the number right, but it's six or under words that they regularly use for emotion in their lives six or under and we are well served like one of her propositions was that if we can have at least 30 or so we will be better served and people found themselves better able to express themselves and get their needs met as well as have more compassion on themselves and things like that too that serve our mental health well i think and that god wants to bring us in our spiritual health And so we do want to move toward that larger vocabulary. I do offer at the end of the book an emotion word list that's based in scripture, just because scripture is has so much language. It's so cool too to step outside of our own cultural context into that Hebrew and Greek cultural context to see some of the language and to see those experiences of stuff I think we've kind of lost. Like we don't use words like weary. We talked about that a little bit before. Mm. We don't use words like delight that often. But then there's others that are way more familiar to us that are comforting to to hear of another human, other humans in another time and place connected to Jesus Christ uniquely experiencing that. So I encourage people to to build their emotion vocabulary. Emotion word lists and wheels are not hills to die on. Okay, so you're going to find a lot of them if you Google or you know use an internet search engine. There's not one right way. And that's really important. And you'll see that in my book that I'm like, I built, I built this and it's a fun tool and it is not everything and every emotion word that's not intended to be. You can make your own. That would be fun. Right? Get a notebook and just start mm. collecting emotion words. How cool would that be? There's even books out there with emotion words from other languages that might serve us well you know the translations of words that other languages have that we don't and it's it's just so cool and i really encourage you to just be curious about those things rather than trying to find a right or wrong one that fits you we call this emotional granularity by the way if you'd like a dorky term which is that nuance of language like when we have more words for our emotions, when we can articulate with more words what we're experiencing, when we can say annoyed or irritated instead of angry, when we can say frustrated, right? Those different nuances and what they mean for us uniquely in that situation, that is what we call granularity, like the grains of sand, right? There's there's more to it. The surface is wider and softer for us then. We are learning about articulation as a tool in the emotional processing toolbox in Emotions and the Gospel. Deaconess Heidi Gaiman will continue the conversation on Mental Health Monday on the Coffee Hour in just a moment. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. (laughs) 
Welcome back to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. We've been talking about articulation, what it means to have vocabulary and naming all of these emotions. And so you, you mentioned granularity before we went to break. And there's, I want to talk about this for just a second, making these word lists. Do these have to be emotional words that we find places or can we just totally make them up? Goodness, no. Please make them up and then send them to me. I want to know all of the wisdom that you have to share in that. I mean, I there's an kind of an, an enduring example in my book of a child I had in play therapy that taught me the word schmad, right? That that we can be that we can be sad and angry at the same time. And that's a unique emotional experience. And I feel like I knew this concept already. I'm already a big fan of making up words. Anyone who has read any of my books knows I like to make up words. Like the the lovely copy editors at both the, the LCMS and at Concordia Publishing House know there's little notes in my manuscript that say, Heidi made up this word. Please leave it in. We know that. <laughs> We know that it's odd. Like, the, and I even say that in this section, the word withness is a word I like to use. And ironically, I actually saw that in a novel recently, which I was really excited about. Or dailiness is another word I like to use. So yeah, make up some language. But I had this one child in play therapy and the and the same child that taught me Schmad also had this metaphor of a dinosaur and it was blue. And it took over the whole house because it was schmad. It just wanted to yell and stomp, but it also was not, you know, actually like rageful. Instead, it was like overwhelmed and sad at the brokenness of the world. And, you know, yes, I think any kind of language that we can apply, whether it's in, you know, a dictionary that we would find online or whether it's from within your heart. And your soul and your mind, those are good things, I think, of God. I mean, that's that's how he made us. So, Sarah, you go for that. I'm excited about that. Awesome. Squishy is my favorite one. Mm. I use it a lot. <laughs> so squishy. how does... Yes. I can't exactly tell you what it is, but I know when I feel it. <laughs> <laughs> that's for another time. Yes, exactly. So... <laughs> How does our how does our context, our family of origin, our culture, how do all of those things affect our ability to articulate emotions and and the the words that we use to articulate emotions? I think this is an area where sometimes we feel frustrated by our capacity and even our mental health, and so we just don't want to do the work because we are limited people. As human beings, we are in general limited, and, and that's one of the, the hardest challenges we have, right? What was the question in the garden? It was about our limitations. Mm -hmm. And so I think being able to understand that as we grow up, it is our experiences that we have and those caregivers in our lives, the people we're surrounded by that help give us our first tools and those foundations that we have. We can grow outside of that, right? We can, but it will be an intentional walk. Because like we have, first of all, a humanity default kind of toward both um, great selfishness, if you will, and the ability to create the evil and sin, honestly. But we also have a default toward good. But you and I know, I mean, this is huge Lutheran theology, is that our default is pretty heavily toward that kind of sinking into ourselves rather than flourishing and growing. And so there's some intentionality in that. So it will feel like work. There, that is your context leaning in, right? That's that growing up as a, say, middle-class white American in rural Missouri is going to impact the way I see emotions, the way the words I have available to me to articulate emotion and all of that good stuff. It's good to know that, but also know it without shame. But yeah, God put you in that time and place and grew you there. And so how else can we grow as well? We hold those things together of like understanding our context as well as knowing that our context doesn't make us who we are and God can work outside of those things. And so we move toward learning and growing every day and understanding our emotions more when we hold those things together, both where we come from as well as what we can discover now. 
Now I'm curious, since we both grew up in what rural or small town Missouri, what similar vocabulary we have mm-hmm. in our in our emotional articulation. Like yeah. know, Sarah grew up in Michigan, so she doesn't She's have different. the same context. She's totally different. And you grew up in like, yeah, yeah, like Detroitish area, right? Like it's yeah, it's yeah. just really different. Well, I think number one, like the a little bit lack of cultural diversity impacts us a little bit, Andy. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, that we didn't grow up around a lot of different kinds of concepts about emotion or the different cultural nuances of the way families worked. And so then how they processed emotion and things like that. I think that's one thing. Another thing that, okay, I'm going to go with this metaphor thing. The image that comes to mind for me when you said that was gooey butter cake. Okay, because that's a very (laughs) specific, you know, St. Louis-y region area thing. But for me, when I picture gooey butter cake, like I get an an emotional sensation of like home and family and warmth and togetherness and belonging is what I would call it. Mm -hmm. And so certain things like that can represent that emotion to us based on culture. And so we want those things. (laughs) My dad and my sisters bring me T-Rabs when they visit. Now I can get them a little bit more regularly, but for a long time I couldn't. And that that's like a a descriptor of love. And then I have the emotional sensation of it attached to that food, right? I eat it and I'm like, oh man, I am love. And I know that. And I'm more jovial than I'm a little easier to get along with because I have those kind of foundational emotions that that make me feel good because of that really silly thing that is T-Raps and gooey butter cake. Do you have anything like that in Michigan? Macintosh apples and the cider mills for sure. And Bell Isle. Oh yeah, cherries. I didn't grow up in cherry. Oh, that's where I live now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's northern. Definitely like I thought you were gonna say Detroit pizza. Like I feel like Detroit pizza pizza. for my husband is a big one. Yeah. Like the big fat greasy Mm -hmm. grass. So good there. Yes. Yes. Isn't it funny how it always comes back to food? And it I know is, food is, it does, yeah. and we'll talk about that next week, I think a little bit when we <laughs> talk about exploration. Oh, I didn't I think it. about talking about food, but right. I was actually going to pose another episode on food and emotion because, yeah, I feel like we could keep going on this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when I say next week, I mean next year. Actually. That is true. Yeah. Because yeah. this In is like our last month. one for this year. <laughs> so, all right. So how how might scripture then let's get move from food back to scripture god's word which he does. <laughs> there's a lot of food uh, in might, there i'm just saying there is yes, this is right true. this how is my point give us, how does it give us vocabulary for articulating emotions i think scripture is rich right so the first of all the hebrew and greek languages are very rich and i Anyone who knows me knows how big of a fan of Hebrew poetry in particular I am. And and we talked about that, I believe, with the Psalms, right? And how the Psalms and poetry itself has kind of this open expression that invites us in and, and it's a little bit friendlier to processing sometimes than like a prescription that we sometimes read or have accidentally read into scripture in like the letters and things like that. And so scripture in itself, there's just a lot of language there. It means more than just what is simply in front of us sometimes. You know, when you think about digging into scripture and then maybe your study notes and a commentary and you get into that Greek and Hebrew nuance, emotion is a really great place for that because people in different cultures have different words for emotion and it builds that granularity but also just like an internal expansiveness to the word that's represented in scripture too. So like when I see anxiety, I think one thing, right? I Well, I don't because of how I work, but I think we do culturally think of one thing usually when we think of anxiety that's specific to our own cultural context and what we've experienced, what we've been taught and all that good stuff. But then when I read a commentary and I understand what Jesus was experiencing when he was meeting someone in their anxiety, as well as that person's experience from their context, and then I look at the specific, you know, Greek in that particular instance that I'm thinking of, whoa, like that a lot of times in the Greek talks about being divided within ourselves is the, what we term as anxiety in the English translation. Okay, those are different things than what I pictured Mm. before, right? And so I think scripture often helps us expand. It helps us expand our language, but also expand our perspective. 
and expand our literal neural pathways to open up and receive new things that bring compassion for ourselves from God in a new way, instead of feeling that stuck feeling of there's something wrong with me because I have anxiety. When we read that, that divided in ourselves, it's a much less shaming way of thinking about it. It's, yeah, it's just a really cool way. And we know from mental health research that any kind of mental expansion like that in perspective and thinking patterns is great for our mental health. That's where we want to be. Very good. We have like 30 seconds left. Anything else you want to include on articulation as we wrap up our time together today and for this season? Well, I would say like a couple articulation 101. I'm going to give you these three things at the end of the chapter that you can do for articulation. Name your emotion. We talked about that at length. Ask questions and get to know them. That's part of articulation. You don't have to know the word for the emotion in order to articulate. Start from that curiosity and ask questions and then let our emotions connect to our stories. Our stories are a huge part of articulation and God's bigger story. And I'll leave you with that. Check out Emotions and the Gospel from Heidi Gaiman. We'll continue the conversation on Mental Health Mondays resuming January 9th. So (laughs) the beginning of 2023, right after we finish the 12 days of Christmas. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you. Anytime. Anywhere. Anywhere.